Our guest today on Pioneers in Broadcasting is really a pioneer in broadcasting. In fact, he, in this day of, of the horrendous conglomeration in, in the broadcasting industry, this guy is my idol because he's a one-man industry. Forget the rest of it. Forget the big conglomerates. This guy does it all. He sells the time. He runs the station. He has a network. He sells CDs. And I he pick up the checks. Everything. And he, has, uh, he does dances and he does... And the thing about him is that he's so pure. That was, that's the quality, I think, that everybody sees in, in Jerry Blavitt. Jerry, nice to have you here. We're here it's in your studio. Here. You're, you're very kind. You're really, you're, you really are very kind. Uh, God has been very good to me uh, because when I was born back in 1940, a light shone on me. And it said, if you're going to do anything in any type of thing in this world, make sure that you own it. Make sure you do it, and make sure you answer to the people that are going to be your fans and the public. And that's the way we've been doing it from the very beginning. Some, some of the, the recording artists should have uh, taken your advice, <laughs> a little bit, the ones that got ripped off a lot, you know, over the years, especially the R&B artists. I want to talk a little bit about your history, because uh, uh, you're, you're really a legend here in Philadelphia, and you're really known all over the country, and, and the world, in fact. Uh, uh, but it, I, I know, and I know that you started dancing on bandstand that was was that the first thing you did was well, your first claim to fame you know actually you know it's it's interesting because if you're a kid growing up in the neighborhoods in philadelphia you belong to a clique you know south philadelphia you belong to 17th and mifflin or 10th and carpenter or 9th and chunk and the most popular show back in the early 50s was bandstand 1952 and uh, kids would say man if i could only dance i would be on that show because all of the girls would notice us. And when you were kids, if you were driving up and down Broad Street, you know, you would blast your radio during the summertime with the convertible top down, only to be noticed. Mm. What neighborhood were you South from? South Philly. South Philly. 17th and Mifflin, uh, 15th and uh, Morris, St. Monica's Parish, St. Thomas's Parish. So what I did, a group of us kids went on the bandstand, and we crashed bandstand. And the only reason they didn't throw us out is because we were good dancers and they needed good dances for Bob Horn's bandstand. And because of that, uh, I started to win the Jitterbug Contest. And because of that, I started to get fan mail, and because of that, Bob Horn made me president of the committee, and the guy that selected the rest of the kids to do Rate the Record. Remember that? Rate the Record? Sure. Okay. Sure. And I always had an ear for rhythm and blues and black music. So when I would hear a song like Shaboom by the Chords, or if I would hear Earth Angel by the Penguins, it attracted my ear, and I would say to Bob, you should put these on to rate the record. And these songs would win, because it was something new, other than Guy Mitchell, other than uh, Vic Damone, and all of this stuff. Because you must understand, Bandstand was playing pop at that mm -hmm. time, okay? Pres Parado, in came the R&B field. It was very white at the time. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So all of a sudden the drifters started to come in. I'm talking about Clyde McFadder and the drifters. The Penguins started to come in. The Chords started to come in. Nappy Brown, Don't Be Angry, songs like this. And because of this, the record guys would come to me. And they said to me, you know, you've got an ear. Would you listen to some of our new product? And I started to pick out records when I was a kid mm -hmm. on bandstand that had a rhythm beat. So I became very friendly with the record promoters. Then I meet a guy by the name of Nat Sigel. Nat Sigel was a booking agent at the old celebrity room. Shelley knows him very well. And he booked Schiolis, Shelby's in the celebrity room. And he had a young comedian that was getting fired every place by the name of Don Rickles. Because uh -huh. Don Rickles was insulting. And the only guy that was doing it at that time was a fellow by the name of Jackie Leonard. Who you sure. might remember being I do. You say, huh? Oh, there's Jackie Leonard. Oh, you little hockey puck over here. Oh, no, no, little lady over there. What kind of dress is that? Rickles picked up the act, but was much more insulting. So many of the clubs were not able to handle that because of the customers. I mean, they were getting really annoyed. So I became the guy to watch after and look after Don Rickles to make sure he didn't get in trouble, to make sure that I dressed him right. He didn't know how to dress. And I was a spippy dresser. I used to dance. And you know, when you're a dancer, mm -hmm. you got to dress the sharp part. Became Don Rickles' road manager, valet. I used to take him to the Erie Social Club. Now, I don't know if you remember the Erie Social Club. I'm sure many people out there looking at this remember the Erie Social Club. Philadelphia in the early 50s and mid-50s during Sunday was knocked out, the Blue Laws. So you could not right. drink in Philadelphia. Right. So to make extra money, when Don Rickles was booked, he was booked Thursday, Friday, and Saturday 
to make extra money, I would drive him up to the Erie Social Club, which was owned by Jimmy the Greek at that time, and Mickey Shaughnessy had a piece of it. So I would drive him in between shows on the weekends, Friday night in between shows of the Erie Social Club, because I was, I was a stick man in those days, they used to say. Because of that, because of my friendship with Nat Sigel and Don Rickles, Nat discovered a group called Danny and the Juniors. Had a song called At the Hop. When Bob Horn lost Bandstand, uh, and he was almost like a second father to me. On weekends, I would spend my weekends in Levittown with him. Well, you led a, a protest about yes. that, by the way. <laughs> yeah. You were, and this was political activism in the, oh, this, in the 50s about was, a guy hosting a TV this show. This is 1956. But you were, I've, I've seen pictures of you with signs outside oh, yeah. the building. You we were, want yeah. Bob Horn. Yeah. And at that time, Roger Clip was president of Triangle TV and all that, and we said, does Roger Clip drink? <laughs> you thought that Bob Horn got a raw deal. Basically. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'll tell you what had happened. If people remember this, and of course, Bob was at fault at this because he should have been a little more careful. I mean, I loved the guy. As a matter of fact, when Bob died, I sent Nat Sigel out there with money to bury him because at that time, he was just a broken man at that time. And I never forget that, Eddie, because I was on stage, and this is very interesting. We did a show for Channel 10 called The Discophonic sure. TV Scene, which was syndicated by Seven Arts, Warner Seven Arts at that time. I contacted Bob in Texas, and I said to him, I'm going to give you $500 a week. I want you to be my representative for that entire area. Houston, Galveston, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. I gave him new life. He died two weeks after that. I made the deal with him. I sent him $1,000 for two weeks. He died after that. And it, it really was very, very sad. But didn't you risk uh, furthering your whatever career you envisioned at the time? Did you risk some of that when you were protesting? I mean, you were kind of out on a limb. Eddie, uh, let me tell you. you know, trying to help that guy. Let, let me tell you. I've always been a person with certain values. If you're my friend, all right, loyalty to me and honor and respect, which unfortunately in this business is no longer there, mm. is more important than making money. We'll always make money. I mean, if you've got a God-given talent, you'll always make money. But you'll never find friends that are going to be loyal and true unless you're loyal and true. Mm. I've said this, success brings false friends and true enemies. You've seen it, I've seen it. When I was riding high, there were a hundred guys around me. As soon as you lost a position, there was nobody around you. And it doesn't matter when you're successful if you're a bad guy or a good guy. <laughs> They're around you, not because of the guy, but the success that the guy has. Yeah. So after the success goes, it doesn't matter if you were good or bad. They just are not around. So in my lifetime, I've always called the shots myself. I've gotten in trouble from the press because of the fact maybe they didn't understand my friendship with certain people. And that started with Bob Horn. Bob Horn was a second father to me. I went to Houston, Texas and lived with him in Houston, Texas for a period of time. You know, and that's the way it was. Well, what happened then? Did they throw you off a bandstand? As oh, a oh, listen, or, let, or, this is a great or, story because George Kohler, who I love, uh, George Kohler, who I love, was a part of the organization here, I can tell you the story. I stopped the kids from going into bandstand because I was president of the committee. Mm -hmm. So they had no kids. Now remember, they're they, going on the air. Kids? They, 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 yeah. Listen, they're going on the air at 3.30 in the <laughs> afternoon with the cameras rolling live and there's nobody in the audience. So they had me pinched. They had me arrested for leading a protest. Right. So as soon as they took me to the police station, all of the kids went in. All right? <laughs> when I got out of the police station the next day, I went back and they didn't have any kids. I stopped the kids from going in again. So Kohler, George, who I love, as I said earlier, they come down and said, Mr. Kohler would like to see you. So I went up to his office, and I sat in his office, and he said, look, la di da di da di da this is not right. You know, you're the president of the committee. You can continue. Dick Clark is a good guy. And at that time, Tony Mamarella mm -hmm. was doing the show in the interim, who was the producer. And I said, I don't want to dance on bandstand. I, don't want, I want Bob Horn back. Did you think you could get him back? I mean, did you really have a... You thought it could I, happen? I mean, it was like a done deal. I was really. not that, that, that smart hmm. in knowing the politics. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. I just knew that this guy 
started Bandstand with Lee Stewart, uh, was, he really was a good guy. I mean, he got himself into a jam because he should have been a little more careful, perhaps, with his personal life. Yeah. But he was a good guy. So the upshot was you came back or? or? Well, I, I went to Houston, Texas. At that time, I was going to Southeast Catholic. I went to Houston, Texas for the summer. Uh, came back. Uh, Danny and the Juniors had a big hit record. Uh, with Nat Sigal, I went on the road with Danny and the Juniors, became their road manager, and worked with Chuck Berry. So Fats you didn't go Stardom. back on bandstand? No, that was right. it. I mean, right. when it was over, right. it was over. Right. And uh, I went on the road with Chuck Berry, Fats Domino, Little Richard, became buddies with them, and uh, came off the road. And in the early part of 1960, there was a very famous cocktail lounge in South Philly called the Venus Lounge. And three guys owned it, three Italian guys, Don Pinto, guys from downtown. And uh, I was pretty well known in the neighborhood as somebody that was in show business to that extent, whatever it was mm -hmm. back then. So they had a crap game at 17th and Mifflin, where I was born and raised. And uh, Don Pinto was saying to his partner, you know, we want to do a live radio show from, from the Venus Lounge, you know, on a Monday night, which was an off night. Mm. So Pinto said, well, talk to Blavitt, you know. And so the other partner, Ray, said, well, What's he know about radio? I said, what do you want to do? You want to do a live radio show? How much money do you have? He said, well, what do you know about it? You can't do it. I said, I'll tell you what. We're shooting dice. I said, I'll tell you what. I had the dice. I said, I got a four. Okay? If I make my four, you'll let me do the radio show. He said, you're not going to make the number. Boom. I made the four. I made the four. So, so this said, is all a big accident. It's it's all, it's everything, everything in my lifetime, I'm telling you, it's like Paul on his way to Damascus mm -hmm. to persecute the Christians. He is hit by lightning. <laughs> and the Lord says, Saul, Paul, Paul, why do you change? Mm -hmm. So I've been hit by lightning, okay? I go to WCAM at that time. There's a guy by the name of Bud Hibbs, who's the general manager. I say, I would like to buy an hour's worth of time. He says, well, I can give you from 10 to 11 right after the Spanish. <laughs> right. At that time, it was right. Spanish, Porsche Perry after me, and all of that other stuff. So he says, $120 for the hour. I said, all right. I go back to Pinto. I said, it's going to cost $120 the club for the hour. I now get $120 from them for the cost. I now go to Crisconi Oldsmobile, and I sub block time. $60 for 15-minute block. Dale Dan Studio, Fry Hopper's Bread, 7-Up, Crisconi. I have $240 coming in because I sold 15-minute blocks. I put the $240 in my pocket, mm -hmm. and I'm paying for the radio show. And I'm doing interviews with people like Bob Crosby, all right, the Crosby Kids, Savannah Churchill, Jersey, Jersey Joe Walcott. I mean, we're doing these interviews. Now, a snowstorm hits, closes the Venus Lounge down. Now, I own the radio time, okay? I have obligation to the sponsors. So I take all of my records that I listened to and danced to on bandstand when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. In those days, you would go to Sunray Drugstore at Brewer and Snyder, right. and they had bins and bins of records, three for a dollar. So I would spend hours and hours buying these records, and in those days, you were able to listen to the record before you bought it. I take all of this music up to CAM. 10 o'clock at night. The storm is horrendous. I start to play the music. There's an engineer there spinning. Snow keeps on coming. I'm not out of there until 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. There's no relief. The phones are ringing off the wall because the kids are off from school. Mm -hmm. They're hearing this crazy guy on the radio. I finally go home at 5 in the morning. I'm married, living at 24th and Mifflin at that time. I get in bed, 8 o'clock in the morning, the phone rings. My wife says, Bud Hibb is on the phone. I said, well, tell him. I'm, I call him when I get up. She said, he's got to talk to you. It's very important. So I said, yes, Bud, what's the problem? He says, the problem. He said, what did you do last night? And I figured I did something wrong. I said, what do you mean? He said, what'd you do last night? I said, I just brought my records up and I played. He said, you know, the phones have not stopped ringing. He said, apparently whatever you've done caused a sensation. So I said to myself, wait a second. These were all oldies I'm playing. Music that these kids today... Well, how do they even know to tune in is the question. I mean, you're it's, on a small station after the Spanish hour. How do they know? How did it snap, catch it, on just like it's, that? It's, 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 
the most amazing thing I think what happened was because they were they were looking for information if the schools were closed. Uh. Okay? <laughs> you know, kids, God bless kids, they're adventurous, you know what I'm so they would probably call their other buddy because no one was playing this kind of music. It was in I mean the no, listen year was this again? Nineteen sixty. Nineteen sixty. Yeah. Okay, sixty, sixty two, that period over there. Uh -huh. So I made the decision, I'm on to something here. I go back to the Venus Lounge and I bring two turntables from Eastern Appliances, which is a broad and more. And I make the mistake, I'm starting to play rock and roll records. With Don Pinto and these guys, this is a lounge, you know, with right. all the number guys and what other stuff. What are you doing? We don't we, we want interviews, you know, go up to the people, hey, how are you? Nice to see you here. Welcome to the Venus Lounge. Let's get you up a hamburger, beep up, up, up. So I said, I'll tell you what, guys. I don't want to do the show here any longer. I'll get you a replacement if you want a replacement. They said, well, we'll think about that. Hmm. I called Bud Hibbs up. I said, Bud, I would like to do a studio show. I said, I cannot give you $120. I want to do it five days a week. I will go out and sell. I will give you all my sponsors. I don't want to keep a dime. I just know I'm on to something. He was gracious enough to say, okay, we'll give it a shot. I went out. Went on the radio from 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock, Monday through Friday. Within two weeks, I did a record hop at a place called the Ice House in Cherry Hill, which became the Delaware Valley Gardens, okay, where mm -hmm. the hockey teams used to go. 2,000 kids. It was the most incredible thing I ever saw in my entire life. From that moment on, that's the way it began. Now, were you the geeter with the heater at I that point? I created that, sure. For that? I mean, right at the beginning? Right at or, the beginning. Or, what had happened is... Where did that come from? I was so crazy on the air, and I knew nothing about radio, okay? Thank goodness there was an engineer there. I then knew, for me to be in this, I just couldn't be Jerry Blabbit, even though they knew me from Bandstand, okay? There was Joan Niagara, who I loved, was the rocking bird. Right. There was Georgie Woods, the guy with the goods. There was Jocko, the ace from outer space. So I said, these guys all had handles. For me to be Jerry Blavin alone doesn't make it. I'm yelling, I'm screaming, I'm finger popping, and I'm saying, I'm the rebel jock. I'm making up all of these rhymes. I'm rocking the big tick tock on the tower power clock, hickory dickory dock. The mouse went up the clock. The geeter said, rock, rock, rock. Here we go with a bop, bop, bop. Did all of that. So I said, but well, you know, I'm crazy. I'm yelling, I'm screaming. What kind of handle? So I'm shaving one day. And I said to myself, wait a second. I'm a 1310, 1340. Because we were on a couple of stations, then we started. Mm -hmm. WHAT, we were also on. I said, an alligator. It lives in the mud in Florida. If you got an accent, you call it a gator, a geeter, mm -hmm. or a gator. Okay. They lay in the mud. They don't bother you. They look, look like they're sleeping. But once you go up near them, boom, they snatch you. Here am I on 1310. Once you tune me in, I got you. You, you say, what, what, what is this I'm listening to? So I got you. The Geeter. Geeter, I'll be the Geeter. But now what makes sense? The music I'm playing is rock and roll. They never heard little Richard, Chuck Berry, Fats Domino. I mean, this is boom, 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 boom. When I'm a kid on the corner, when you're a kid on the corner, we're all hanging out in the corner in the wintertime. A guy comes by with a car. We're shivering. We all jump in the guy's car. We say, turn the heater up. After 10 minutes, it's so hot in that car, you say, turn the heater down. I was the geeter with the hot yeah. heater with the music. After a while, the, father, the kids used to say to their kids, turn that guy down or turn that guy off. The geeter with the heater. The boss with the hot sauce. This is before Bruce Springsteen was the boss. Th listen, right. absolutely. and you know where it came from? When I was a kid, I used to go to Lawnside for ribs. Now, okay. you know, the only way you eat ribs Lester is with hot sauce. There you got it. Yeah. But you got to get the hot sauce. Yeah. But if you put too much hot sauce, you go, ah, maroon, ah, ah. Same thing with the heater. The geeter with the heater, the boss with the hot sauce. The rebel jock rocked sounds, the big TikTok. Sounds logical to me. <laughs> it worked. It worked. It worked. And there you have it, the inside yep. scoop on the whole thing. So it, it, it's interesting how it evolved. You really didn't start as a broadcaster. No. You started in, in, in this other area, you know. Well, you uh, know, Eddie, i got to tell you something. And you are a broadcaster. And all of my other colleagues out there, I call them all of the other scoundrels out there, are, are broadcasters. I'm not a broadcaster. By the grace of God, I am a free spirit, and I am an entertainer, performer, whatever you say. And I've always created my own persona, yeah. you see. Yeah. 
And I always was able not to worry about the money because I always believed that if I had something good to offer the public, they would support it. And they've been supporting it now for 40 years. You're, well, you're kind of an outsider in a way yeah. because you've, you've worked outside what I would call the mainstream. You've never uh, tried to work for the number one top 40 station in town and, and, and be constrained by their rules. You've always been on the outskirts making your own way. And now you, well, you have five stations five in the stations. network now. You're, you're a network. You run it yourself. You have your own studio. You do whatever you yeah. want. What a dream situation for well, you. It's, it's great incredible. because I, I can create. You see, right. radio, when you had the freedom to create, Tell you loved it. it. Tell me about you it. You peaked. Right. You were tremendous because you did your own creating with your own music. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. When I was hot on TV, and we were in 40 markets, I get a call from Joe Conway from WIBG. At that time, IBG was the number one station. Mm -hmm. We were so hot that he couldn't ignore me. He said, you're on WHAT. We would like you to be a part of WIBG. Really? He said to me, we want you... He said, but we don't want the Geeter. Oh. We want Jerry Blavitt. Like they had Jerry Stevens, Bill Wright. Right. We want Jerry Blavitt. I said, well, what, do you, what, what, what are you going to pay? He says, well, what do you want? I said, for me not to be the Geeter, $100,000 a year. He said, what? I said, you're asking me not to be the Geeter. I said, you know, I make $100,000 a year being the Geeter, doing my record hops, doing the TV show. Jerry Blavitt created the Geeter. The Geeter is the act. Jerry Blavitt is the human being, you see. But you had the freedom. And, and freedom. to give that up, I mean, if you had started without the freedom, it might be a different story, but you, you tasted what that freedom is all about. I wouldn't do and it any to try other way. To get, but then to try to give it up, why would you want to? Right. Eddie, there was a great black dish jockey by the name of Dr. Perry Johnson. I don't know if you remember Dr. Perry Johnson. He was on WDAS Night Times. He ruled the nighttime airwaves. WCAU, and you know the way these radio stations jump on different formats. If it doesn't work, they'll mm -hmm. discard it. You, you know better than anybody else. Yeah. They lured Dr. Perry Johnson away from WDAS. They put him on CBS. WCAU with that disco craze. Mm -hmm. And they said, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do that, right. you got it. You know what Dr. Perry Johnson is today? I don't know where he's at today. Mm -hmm. And he was a great talent. So if you believe in yourself, don't go for the big dollars. Go for the freedom and the creativity. You know why Howard Stern is so big? As Tell bad me. as he is, Tell me. he's got the freedom. He does anything he wants to do and say. That's not my cup of tea, because my belief is always if you have an audience out there, lead them the right way. Don't influence them in a derogatory mm -hmm. way. And that's the way I was with the kids. When I did my thing, and I tell you, many people don't know this. I go to church every week, and I thank God. I go to St. Joe's, 530 Mass. Thank God for what I have. And I've always said, give me the ability to reach out, to communicate and lead it in the right way. And that's the gift that I've got. You take that away from me, then it doesn't work. Hmm. It doesn't work. It's been a remarkable career for you, and you're still going strong. How, how about your relationships with some of the artists you've... Uh, I've seen pictures of you with a lot with Sinatra. Yeah. And how about Dick Clark? Did you ever make peace with Dick I, Clark? Or, this or? is a great story. This, this is a great story. When I was the road manager for Danny and the Juniors, at that time, Dick Clark and there was nothing wrong with it. it, was very much involved with the record business, as Bob Horn was involved mm -hmm, with the record sure. business. And Dick Clark was responsible for the song at the hop. It originally was called, Let's Do the Bop. All right, Dick said, no, 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 change it to at the hop. So he had a piece of at the hop. I was the road manager. We did the Beech Nut Gum Little Theater on 44th and Broadway. Saturday night. Saturday job, night thing. Right. I am coming home, I stayed over in New York City. Now remember, I'm 16 years of age, Oh. okay? Oh, I was on the road. I used oh. to handle all the money at 16. Oh, I, I, listen, oh, I... Oh, I didn't realize. Oh, yeah. So I am at Pennsylvania Station going back to Philadelphia, and who comes walking on the platform with his bag but Dick Clark, okay? Hello, Jerry. How are you? Hi, Dick. Well, I'm going back to Philadelphia. Well, sit with me. And we sat. And I said, Dick, you know, no disrespect. I said, you know, I hope what I did for Bob Horn, he said, let me tell you something. 
And after this train ride, we became dear buddies even till today. Mm -hmm. He's my pal. He said, I have great respect for what you did. He said, you know, I really didn't get along with Bob. He said, but I inherited that show. And everybody that Bob Horn helped and everybody that was in business with Bob Horn is now in business with me. Harry Finfer, mm -hmm. Ed Barsky, Harold Lipsius, Alan Sussel. They were all in the record business. That's the way it was. Mm -hmm. The king is dead. Let's go with the new guy. Right. He said, but you didn't. He said, you could have been the head of the committee because you were the head of the committee. You knew every one of the dancers. You were the most popular kid at that time on the Bob Horn Bandstand show. He said, but you didn't come on to my show. He said, I have great respect, respect for you. Wow. And I said, when I got off the train, I said, let me tell you something, Richard. Thank you very much. You've got a friend. Anything you need in my capacity, and I'm a kid 16 years old. We became <laughs> buddies. We became buddies. When I went on the radio in 60, 61, 62, Dick Clark is the guy that went on television and said, I was driving home last night and I was listening to the Geeter in Camden and he played this song by, by Claudine Clark. Mm. And I was listening to the Geeter and he played this song by the Majors. And I heard the Geeter play the Four Seasons. And I made a record, which right. Dick Clark was very instrumental in. One more time back to school, Bernie Lowe, Dick called Bernie Lowe up and said it was, it was a talk record. I still have the record, Back to School. Yon teenagers, oh, oh yeah, oh. yon teenagers gather round. A hawk to the sound I'm putting down. Is that, uh, that's, is that currently available on CD, uh, Jerry? I, I can get it for you. I can get it. But Clark is the one who called Bernie. He said, let, let Blavitt do the rap. And I went on bandstand nationally. He said, this kid is the hottest thing in Philadelphia. I, it was, I mean, so you did go back to bandstand well, sort of, as a performer. As a performer. Yes. Yeah, not as a dancer. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. How about Sinatra? How did you? Well, I got a thing here. There's a little thing here. It says, to the Geeter, my main man loved Frank Sinatra. That's pretty heavy. Okay, I mean, I, I go back with, well, you see, I was Sammy Davis's best man. Shelley remembers that. Really? Yeah. Sammy got married in Philadelphia. Uh, Sammy used to say, Man, you, you're the white Sammy Davis, because I'd be dancing and moving and all that other stuff. I never thought of it that way, but, but he, I think, you know, you think he was right. He said, he said, Geeter, he said, you got my moves. I said, I ain't got your moves, man. I'm the boss with the hot sauce. He'd break up. But Sammy and Frank and Dean, uh, just a world of show business. You'll never see it again. Hmm. Never see it again. Never see it again. I know. I see that they show a lot of videos of Sinatra occasionally on TV. He was absolutely amazing. It right. was it was an era of class and style. Yeah. And you know he learned this from Bogart. You know, hmm. he learned, he loved Bogie. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know that was a style out there. When I I lived out in LA for a brief period of time, I did the Monkees, I did the Mod Squad, uh, I was on the Joey Bishop show. We did the Tonight Show. Uh, Hollywood at that time, hmm. I mean, was. Uh, style and class. And, you know. Joan Crawford was a dear friend of mine. Really? Because we had Pepsi Cola. She came on our TV show on Channel 6 many times. I mean, it, w it would take her an hour before she would go out shopping to make sure that she looked right when she went out shopping. Uh, what do you think about the future of, of broadcasting now that everything's been conglomerated? I mean, you've got your little kingdom here, which is wonderful, but you're very unique. A, a regional network like this has to be really rare in, in this country yeah. right now. Uh, you pull it off. I don't, I don't know how you do it, but you do it because of it's the music. Uh, it is the music, but it's also you, and it's it's yeah. what you built up over the years in this area. But uh, you must have some thoughts about the conglomeration that's taking place in radio. Well, uh, and let me tell you what I, I, I believe. I believe you know you had asked me earlier, how did these kids find me? Yeah. How do these kids know? Okay, and I came up with well, perhaps maybe it was they were looking for they were looking for something, and they were looking to find out if they were from school. I believe what happened back then will happen every day because I think people are tired of the sameness and people are hip enough to know that it's a format that if you right. take the music out you put another music and it's the same thing as right. you and I know right. the, the pie, okay, right. the clock. Right. There's a thing called XM satellite. Are you familiar with that, XM radio? I've heard of it, yes. I think that that's going to be the next creative end of this business. Mm -hmm. I think radio as we know it today, within 10 years, will be completely changed. I think the internet, people are going to be plugging into the music. I mean, we're on the internet. Uh, that you, would be GeeterGold. GeeterGold.net. And you have no idea. We get letters and email from people all over the world that 
are mesmerized by what I'm doing because nobody is doing what I am doing today, mm -hmm. you see. Right. You know the way radio works. Before they play an oldie, they'll research it. Right. And these program directors don't How understand. How do you research it, Jerry? You just looked up the pile, I guess, or something. <laughs> I, go <laughs> from, I go from the heart. The brain. I, I say, on Gita Go Radio, we play from a heart, not a research chart. If it hits my ear and I like it, I am the guy that's selling it, communicating it to an audience. The unfortunate thing today is young kids today, they're playing music that they don't know, that they don't like. They're just voices. In audience, it's like an actor. When you see an actor work, he's got the thing going. You believe what he's doing. I believe in what I am doing. So if I like it, I present it. We not only create, but we also educate. Mm -hmm. We talk about the artists, we talk about the music, we talk about the musicians, we talk about the studio where it was first recorded, and we talk about the wonderful people who were the pioneers, the George Golners, the Morris Levies, the Jerry Wexlers at that time, the Ahmet Erdogans, the High Weisses. I mean, these were the visionaries back then. How about your peers in radio? Uh, you mentioned Jocko and... Jocko to me was... Jocko to me was the influence because I knew nothing about radio. Mm -hmm. And Jocko is another one who, at the very beginning, when he heard me, said to me, you got something here. Don't let anybody discourage you. And I mm -hmm. must tell you something. There are jockeys today that are working on oldie stations that knocked the heck out of me. They said, what's this kid know? Nobody wants to hear oldies. Uh -huh. Well, you know the way our industry is. These are the same guys who are playing the oldies today. Jocko was the best. Mm -hmm. And you know, Jocko's act is from Hot Rod. The original ace from outer space was Hot Rod Hubert out of Baltimore. Mm -hmm. Jocko comes from a very well family. Mm -hmm. Jocko's dad was a principal in Baltimore. And Jocko perfected the rocket ship show. But it was class and style. You see, I've always been attracted to older people and people that have a certain style. Mm -hmm. How about Alan Freed up in New York, uh, Cleveland and then New York? Uh, Alan Freed. Alan Freed, as you know, is the man that is responsible for terming it rock and roll. He right. said the white kids. He saw the white kids dancing to black music. Right. And I worked the Alan Freed shows with Jack Cook, with Danny and the Juniors in those days, with Frankie Lyman. Alan said, these kids are rocking to this music, and they're rolling to the music, you see. The condonation in those right. th connotation in those days was that, let's ball, you know? Yeah. The adults said, oh, this is terrible. Let's right. ball. What are they, rocking? What do you mean they're rocking and rolling? What are they rolling, you know? Yeah. But Freed was the guy that first white disc jockey. He was not the first disc jockey to play black music. He was the first white disc jockey to play black music right yeah. now. So he was important in that. And no question story about is, it. Absolutely. It's interesting as well. Dick Clark kind of lucked out and inherited this thing, but he did it really well. Uh, let me tell you something about Dick Clark. And I said to him, Dick Clark is probably the best businessman that you will yeah. ever, ever meet. Yeah. See, I am an entertainer. I am a performer. I have a certain business sense. You're quite a businessman, well, I would say. To put this all together yourself? The business I... of the Geeter, yes. Yes. But Dick Clark, in my opinion, is a better businessman than a performer. Uh -huh. And he's very smart that way. But he had a certain charm. He oh, absolutely. Had he had the look. He, had, he yeah. absolutely. Which Bob Horn didn't, as I, as That's I right. recall. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bob Horn could have never, and I said that to Dick. I said, you know, when we were on the train, I said, you know, i got to tell you something. As much as I love Bob, he could have never done what you've done. Because, you know, the network, Channel 6 offered the network the Bob Horn Bandstand. Hmm. They didn't want to take it. They did with Dick Clark, though, because he had the look. Yeah. That was Pat Boone at that time. That was yeah. Dick Clark at that time. We should have mentioned also the art, because I know in my relations with artists how much they appreciate when, when someone goes out of their way to help them. And I know you've done that for so many. And you continue to do it. And I know there's so many artists who you, whose music you keep alive today by playing it on your show. Well, I, I, I am in awe of talented people. I really, really am. You know, I, I have a retentive memory because I love, mm -hmm. you understand? When you love something, right. it comes to you like that. I mean, I can tell you Would about Would you say a record geek? Would you call yourself a record geek, maybe? Show business entertainer <laughs> geek, maybe. Yes, yeah, something like that, exactly. I mean, I mean do you sit there and look at the matrix numbers on the records? No, that I don't do. Okay. No, 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 no. Okay. If it hits my ear, it goes to my heart. If it goes to my heart, it's in there. It, it's it. It stays. Mm -hmm. do you, how do you file your records? Do you file I them by genre? You know, they're I just piled up. No, I, I just, just, I just, I, in other words, as I'm, as, as I'm doing my show, like, don't. I'll give you an example. I'll, I'll do, you know, Leaving Here by Eddie Holman. Eddie Holland, and then I'll go with a house party because the rhythm and the beat is still the same. 
Then if I'm going to bring it down, I will go with a stinger. But and, yeah. No sleeves. Don't they get worn no, out? Okay. You, can you replace them? These, these are, look, these are the original labels. Some of them can't be replaced. Look right? at this. this the original right. promotion copy, uh -huh. 1961, Sherry. The original, the white copy over there. And okay. you play this actual Absolutely. record. You don't worry about it scratching or wearing no. out. No, not at all. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Doesn't matter. <laughs> You are amazing. Jerry, it's certainly been our Ed pleasure. Ed Shockey, let me tell you something. And I, I want to tell these people out here about this man. He says, whatever I have done in this industry, this man, for what he has done for radio and broadcasting, is really one of the pioneers because you did it much the same way I did it. Because when you were doing your thing, you guys were considered to be rebels, outcasts, as I've been considered in my entire lifetime by legitimate right. radio. Right. You made it work. You are a superstar in your world, and I mean that. Guys like Springsteen say to me, how's Ed Shockey? When I did Billy Joel, all right, and I sent him the Italian hoagies, he said, why don't you send Ed Shockey with the hoagies? So, I mean, you know, you, 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 this man has done his thing your way. Thank you, Jerry. It's been our pleasure. I'm Ed Shockey for Pioneers in Broadcasting with the legendary Jerry Blavitt.